Well, me and we're going to have a good time. Let's have fun. We love to have fun here at Freedom Church. Amen? Amen. 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 Y'all ready for a word? Yeah. All right. For the three of y'all ready, let's turn to Genesis chapter <laughs> 25. Genesis chapter number 25. And uh, when you get it, stand up. Let's do something. Well, y'all, let's stand up for the reading of the word today. Stand on your feet. Stand on your feet. If you got it, say, I got it. I mean, Genesis is the first book of the Bible. If you need more time, say, I'm going to look on the screen. There it is. Yeah. If you don't have your Bible or you don't have it, but here it is. Begin. There you go. <laughs> All right. Better late than never. Uh, Genesis 25, beginning at verse 29. Here's what it says. Once Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he is also called Edom. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, and then he got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Uh, if you're not too mean, high five three people on your way to your seat. Look them in the face. Don't high five them. Look them dead in their face. Point at them and say, you can't be that hungry. <laughs> three people, three people, not two and a half. You can't, you can't be that hungry. You, you can't be, you can't be online. You can't be that hungry. You, you can't be that hungry. You can't be that hungry. Uh, we are in the middle of a 21-day fast. Uh, we are fasting, and God is going to speak to us, and he's already moving in our midst. And uh, we're at the point in the fast where, let's be honest, uh, one week in, we are hungry. <laughs> uh, Y'all too spiritual to laugh at that. That's cool. Uh, but I am hungry. Huh? I'll take you out of it. Uh, we're at the point in the fast where I am hungry. And, and the truth of the matter is, I'm hungry because uh, I've cut some things out of my diet. And I'm not just hungry uh, because I'm hungry, not just my physiological being is hungry. I'm like psychologically craving the things that I've removed from my diet. I'm psychologically desiring things that I want to eat. And, and at this point in my fast, my senses are heightened, which means when I drive down the street and I see a restaurant that has what I desire, I didn't notice how many of them there were along the highway prior to the fast. And, and then I look at billboards that have pictures of the foods that I want to eat, and they look, the pictures that they take are so amazing. And when I'm watching something on TV, or I'm, I find myself on YouTube, every ad is advertising something I cannot eat. Am I alone, or is there anybody else who is following along with me? We are at the point in the fast where we are committed to what it is that we believe God wants to do, but we are being tempted by everything around us. Our senses are heightened. We are seeing things and hearing things. Somebody mentioned French fries. You be on alert. You're like, fries? Who said fries? Somebody said fries. I've been eating them. They're vegetables. Amen. Uh, uh, amen. <laughs> Tell the truth. You know? Let's be real. Uh, but we're at this point in the past where our senses are hiding. And, and I, I got to be honest, I want to be transparent because if I don't want to be anything, I want to be transparent. Uh, I was at a retreat this week with seminarians and pastors, Christians, people who have given themselves over to the service of the Lord. And I thought that all of us together would be fasting. I mean, it's the beginning of the year. We we're seeking God, and we'll do this together. I took this opportunity thinking that when I go, I will not be alone, only to find out that I drove four and a half hours to go to the middle of nowhere to be surrounded by a group of people who were going to eat as much as they could. <laughs> and I will be the lone person starving himself. And in the middle of starving myself, I, I thought to myself, I'll be okay, I'll be okay, uh, because uh, while I'm starving myself, they're going to have this cafeteria-style food, only to find out two things, two things that worked against me. One, there was a group of pastors there, and one of the pastors claimed to be this great chef. And every day he's like, you know what, tonight I'm going to fry y'all some chicken. 
And then the next night, I'm going to make y'all some homemade hamburgers. And he's just cooking and cooking and cooking. And then I thought the cafeteria food won't be that bad. I'll, I'll be able to avoid that. I get in there, and this woman gets up every morning. I would still get up at my same time. I wake up at 430, do my devotional, do some reading, do some work. And then this lady was coming in. She was preparing breakfast for everybody. So it was just me and her every single morning. She'd walk in. I'd say, hey, how you doing? She'd say, hey. Then she'd go to the kitchen. She'd start preparing. And all of a sudden, she's cooking homemade potatoes for breakfast and eggs and bacon and all of this stuff. And I'm thinking, what happened to slops, oatmeal, croissants, and, and, and uh, fruit? They cooking a full breakfast. By Thursday, I couldn't take it no more. I walk into where she's cooking. As a matter of fact, here's what happened. I'm outside of the room where she's cooking. And it was like the cartoons. Y'all remember that back in the day? The scent wave came and hit my nose. And I couldn't stay seated anymore. And I did one of these. Straight to the kitchen. And I find myself face to face with sausages. But they weren't regular sausages. And I asked that, I said, what kind of sausage are you? She says, it's a combination sausage. There's some beef and pork and deer, and it's all mixed in. I said, really? <laughs> Tell me about the sausage. She says, well, I cooked them this way. She's preparing it. And I started to ask myself, I said, well, I never told her I was fasting. I told you that I was waking up early, and it was just me and her. Uh, she's going to the kitchen. I'm studying in the little hall area. And I said, um... I never told her I was fasting, and I looked at her, and I said, um, I said, uh, what, what, what are those sausages again? And I said to myself, I said, well, nobody here but me and her. Uh, maybe I could try a sausage. I mean, and, and I don't want to be too legalistic about my fast. I mean, I, I won't get this opportunity again. And while I was sitting there tempted to eat the sausage, I had this thought, don't you dare eat the sausage. I was hungry, and the smell made me question my commitment, but come close. But the anticipation of my expectation outweighed the temptation of my situation. I need for somebody to come close and hear me say that again. The hunger and the smell made me question my commitment. Because, see, I'm not just turning over the plate so that I can get my abs. I'm not just turning down the plate so that I can fit into some clothes. I'm not just turning over the plate to lower my glycemic index. No, I'm turning over the plate because I believe that God wants to do something in and through me that can only happen through prayer and fasting. I've got an expectation, and the anticipation of my expectation outweighed the temptation of my situation. Y'all, y'all, I didn't forget what the series we're in. I told you you can't be that hungry, but the series we're in is called Great Expectations. We, we've got an expectation for God to move. We're fasting not because we want to lose weight. That's a, fr a fringe benefit. We're fasting not because we want a clear mind. That's a, fa a fringe benefit. We're fasting for the presence and the power and the purpose of God. Whatever that is, I'm expecting it. Whatever that is, I'm desiring it. Whatever that is, I want it. And I could not eat and know that I had given up what God had promised. The narrative that we just read, there was somebody who had an expectation, but it became less than their temptation. And every day in your life, you're going to come into a place where your expectations and your temptations collide. You're going to have to make a decision. Do I believe where it is that I'm going? What it is that God has promised? Or do I settle for what it is that I see or feel? Your temptations and your expectations will collide. And you're going to have to make a decision. Will I believe and stand for what it is that God has promised? Or will I settle for what it is that I desire? Here's the truth of the matter. The entirety of scripture is filled or wrought with expectation. From Genesis to Revelation. The Bible starts with expectation when God says, I want to make man in my image. And we hear this term, image of God, but we have to fully understand what that meant. This is expectation. What does it mean? In the, in the ancient Near East, this was not a term that was specific just to the Hebrews. In the ancient Near East, kings who ruled would be thought of as deities. And some people would call them gods. And what they would do in every territory that they would began to move in, they would set up images of themselves that were called the image of God. 
And that image was there to post and say that this king rules in this place. It was an expansion of his kingdom. And so when God says that I want to call man and make him in my image, place him in the earth and call him my image bearer on the earth, God is saying this is an expansion of my kingdom. When God made you and gave you his image, that means that everywhere you go, he has an expectation that you will bring the kingdom there. There is an expectation that the kingdom should be in your home. There is an expectation that the kingdom should be on your job. There is an expectation that the kingdom should be in your classroom. There is an expectation that the kingdom should dwell in you and everywhere your foot treads, the kingdom is there because you are the image of God representing the kingdom wherever you are. The Bible started with expectation. That when we are fruitful and multiply, it's not just to be the progenitors of what it is that humanity is. It's to expand the kingdom of God. There's expectation. Bread into the whole entirety of scripture. There is expectation even after man fails God. That man sins and is separated from God. But there is expectation when God says that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. I don't mean to take you back to sixth grade biology. But a woman has an egg and a man has a seed. But God says the seed of the woman in expectation of a virgin birth. So that a savior will come to bring salvation to everyone. And this is our expectation. That God not only sees our sin but saves us from it. There is expectation in the beginning of the Bible and all the way into Revelation when the Bible says we will sit and feast at the Lamb's table. Here's what he says, and we'll do it forever. The Bible does not culminate in an event that closes the story. The Bible concludes with an event that leads to anticipation of eternity that God says from the kiva to kiva or cover to cover, the Bible is filled with expectation. Which means we have great hope inside of us. Which means that everything about us should be filled with anticipation and expectation of the promises of God to do what he said he would do. But might I suggest to you that when our temptations collide with our expectations and we are, have a desire for compromise, it is not that we are really that hungry. That the reality is the appetites that you have created, the things that you say you need or want, it is not that you are that hungry that you avoid the expectation in favor of the temptation. It are, there are a couple of things that I see in this story that Esau uh, uh, had as character traits that are also traits inside of us that are actually happening. You can't be that hungry. And so, in order for us to have the anticipation of our expectation outweigh the temptation of our situation, I want to show you what the text says about Esau. The first thing that might be happening inside of you when your temptations and your expectations collide and you submit or want to submit to your temptation, you might be like Esau, short-sighted. You might be like Esau, short-sighted. Look at the text again. The Bible says in verse 29, once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, 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 let me have some food, some of that red stew. I'm famished. Esau is short-sighted. I need for you to understand that Esau has this, 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 this. Uh, well, before I give you that, I need for you to understand who these characters are in this text. I don't want to assume that you know who Jacob and Esau are. Jacob and Esau are twins, the son of Isaac and Rebekah, the sons of Isaac and Rebekah. Isaac is the son of Abraham. Abraham is the person who we call the father of faith, but God said to him that he will be the father of many nations. God makes Abraham a promise that there will be many nations coming through him and being blessed from him. This is a, this, this season or this, this, this thought of Abraham being a father of many nations is very important. We hear it, we say it, but we read our Bibles too fast. And we don't understand the concept of Abraham being a father of many nations. God makes Abraham a promise. He says, you're going to be a father of many nations. The problem is when God tells Abraham that, he's 75 years old and him and his wife have never been able to conceive a child. Him and his wife have never been able to conceive a child. So they figure maybe God is talking figuratively. And God says, no, from your loins, I'm going to birth an actual child. And from that child, I'm going to bless the rest of the world. 
Sarah gets a hold of that understanding and says, well, maybe Abraham is supposed to be you, and you do it with somebody else. So with him and Hagar, they have Ishmael. And God says, that's not what I said. I said, you and Sarah are going to have a baby. God eventually blesses them. They have a child together. His name is Isaac. He is the result of the promise of God that Abraham would be a father. Abraham has Isaac. Isaac marries Rebekah. The only problem is Rebekah suffers from the same problem his mother suffers from. She is not able to have children. They pray. God hears. He answers. Say that again, Robert. It felt good saying it. They pray. God hears and answers. Say it one more time. It felt that good. They pray. God hears. He answers. I don't know what you're praying for today, but God hears and he will answer. When God answers, though, he doesn't always make the answer easy. Because Rebecca gets pregnant, and the Bible says that the kids are fighting in her womb. They're warring like two nations, the Bible says. Rebecca asks for a clarity on what's actually happening. The scripture says, listen, what's happening is that's literally what's happening. Two nations are warring on the inside of you. And because they're warring on the inside of you, you need to understand one people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. Hold on to the language because it's going to be important in a little bit. One people will be stronger than the other and the older will serve the younger. Well, what happens? They give birth. The first child that comes out going to be the older. It is Esau. He comes out hairy and red, and they name him Esau. But as he's coming out, they see a hand holding on to his heel. And there's this boy named Jacob that they name him trickster, deceiver, supplanter. And they say he is one who is a tricky one right there. He tried to pull his brother back in. They name him Jacob. The two sons grow up together. And the Bible says that, that, that Rebekah loves her some Jacob. She says, oh, Jacob is my boy. When I'm in the kitchen and I'm cooking and I'm making recipes and all that, he's standing behind me with a notebook like, yep, I'm going to write that cookbook. Mama knew best. And it's going to have all the recipes and it's going to be good. It's going to be a bestseller. And people are going to be like, man, Rebecca could show a cook. And Rebecca was like, that's my boy. He appreciates me. He sees me. And, and, and Rebecca gives favoritism to Jacob. But Isaac loved him some Esau. Esau was a man's man, or what we would perceive to be a man's man. He's hairy. He's the outdoorsman. Esau had the ability with one bow to kill three ox. The Bible don't say that. I made that up. Don't, don't take that. <laughs> he goes in, and he draws back. Boop, boop, boop. Hey, Dad, we got meat for the next year. 2023 is covered. That's Esau. And Isaac loved him some Esau. And the preferences of the children, I mean, the preferences of the parents became the pain of the children. Say that again. The preferences of the parents become the pain of the children. Anybody ever experienced favoritism? That, that while the parents are trying to prefer what it is that the kids or what kid they prefer and what they want their kid to be, they're projecting onto their children and it becomes the pain of the kids. These brothers can't get along because they're competing for the value in the eyes of their parents. Parents, can I parenthetically stop, pause and tell you, you need to stop putting your preferences on your children. You're raising your kid to vicariously be what you always wanted to be, and they can't be themselves. Your preferences have become their pain. You're telling them what career they should have, what college they should go to, what life they should have, and you're missing the point of raising them up in the nurture and the admonition of God, allowing him to rise purpose up, and then them to pursue what it is that God has called them to. Stop allowing your preferences to become your kid's pain. You, you know the result of it. Some of you live with it. Your parents' preference has become your pain. And now you're living as an adult person with the pain of your parents' preference, thinking that you are not good enough and you've never lived up to it. Let's break the cycle. Maybe it's not a preference you put on your kid, but it's a preference your kid noticed because you preference success over them. So every trip was more important than their game. Every promotion was more important than their recital. And everything that they did, they found themselves absent because your preferences produced their pain. I'm not telling you that you don't need to go after and provide for your families. What I am saying is we got to be careful that our preferences are not producing pain. That was parenthetical. It's not my message. Let's get back to the message. Esau and Jacob grew up with the preferences of their parents, and their parents had given, shown them favoritism. And so where our text starts is one day Jacob is cooking some stew. 
because he's been finding this recipe and he's perfecting this recipe. He's dropping his seasonings. He's doing his thing. And here it is that Esau walks in and Esau's been out hunting and Esau shows up and Esau says, yo, yo, Jake, 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 what you cooking, boy? It smell good. And I'm hungry. I need some of that right now. He says, I don't know what you're cooking, but it sure smells good. And I need some of that red stuff right now. He stirs the pot and looks in and says, I need whatever you got right now. And Jacob, his brother, he's the supplanter. He's the manipulator. He's the trickster. He sees an opportunity. He sees an opportunity to take advantage of his brother's misfortune. And I need for you to understand that you have an enemy who is watching you, how you, live, how you deal with your desires. Say it again. You have an enemy who's watching you and how you deal with your desires. There are some things that you want, some things that you have an immediate desire for. I'm not saying need. Notice I didn't say need. Some things you have an immediate desire for, some things that you want right now, some things that you say you can't live if you don't get. And the enemy is waiting because he's pouncing on your, 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 your desire. He wants to manipulate what it is that you are feeling. And here's Esau, he comes in, he says, Jake, you got to make me some of that stew. And, and, and Jacob, Jacob is going to take advantage of the opportunity and get the birthright from his brother. Now, we will work this birthright throughout the rest of the message, but I need for you to understand that this is very important. Remember I told you this whole father thing is important because Abraham is going to be the father of many nations. That doesn't just mean that he's going to have kids. It means he's going to be the one who has the responsibility of what the Hebrews call the bet ah. Bet, meaning house. Ab, meaning father. The, ha the head of the father's house. Which means he's going to be the leader of his father's house. And the birthright goes to the oldest son to carry on this legacy. The birthright goes to the firstborn child to carry on this legacy. And here's what Esau's willing to do. Sell his legacy for lentils. Y'all missed it. He is hungry and has a desire in the moment, and he's willing to sell his entire legacy for lentils. He's willing to sell his entire promise for, for, for stew. And Jacob takes advantage of it. But I got a question for you. Jacob was in the kitchen cooking, and I said, don't, don't miss my point, uh, Esau is short-sighted. He's short-sighted in the sense that there is a legacy to become, but there is still even a more short-sighted thing. He's willing to sell his legacy for lentils when the truth of the matter is we got to pay attention to the text. Jacob is cooking in the kitchen in the house. Oh, missed it. When I read the Bible, I just think common sense. Jacob is cooking stew in the house. Why would Jacob be cooking stew for dinner? What do you do when somebody cooks at your house? You eat. I mean, it's not deep. Y'all waiting for the pop quiz and the whole flip and the epiphany moment. None of that. Jacob is cooking so that they can eat. Who is he cooking for? The people in his house. I just gave y'all the rundown of who lives in the house. Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, Esau. Isaac loved Jacob, so okay, uh, Jacob could say, I'm going to make a play for my mama, but I just told you who run the house. Isaac is the best. Ah, you think he's going to let his favorite die of starvation? The food was there in the father's house for him. Ooh, I'm going to say it over here. The food was there being prepared in the house for him. But because he's so, so short-sighted and wants what he wants right now, he gets ready to sell off his legacy for something he was about to get. Don't miss this. There are several of you who are faced with a temptation right now, and you're wondering, if I don't take this opportunity, I'll never get another one. If I don't do this, it'll never be there for me. If I don't get this, I'm going to die. And the Lord says, why would you sell, some, sell your legacy for something that's on the two people in this room to understand that it's on the way. It's on the way. Whatever God has promised you is on the way. Whatever God has for you is on the way. And if you stop short of understanding and seeing beyond what you feel right now, you'll miss that what's on the way is about to show up for you. And you'll sell what God has for you down the line for what your desire is right now. He was short-sighted, and I don't want you to be short-sighted. One of the beauties of being created in the image of God is we have the ability to frame and plan for the future. We can see beyond the immediate. They say that elephants have the greatest memory. 
that, that elephants have the greatest memory, that they can remember for years and years and years, and they remember everything. But what elephants don't do is plan and shape cities. Because what they remember from the past, they still don't have the ability to, pro, to pro perfect what's going on in the future. When we cut down trees, we see rings that tell us the distance or the time, rather the distance or the size of this tree from its past. But what the trees, while they are used to build up what it is that we see and that we sit on and what we lean into, the trees themselves could not make a future for us. What the human experience has given us is the opportunity to see past where we are into where we're going. And to when we have discipline, this is so good. I got to slow down and say this again. The human experience has afforded us this ability as image bearers of God to see into the future through your expectation. You have the ability to see into the future through your expectation. Now, here's the reality. What you also have the ability to do when you submit to God and are fueled by the power of his Holy Spirit is to frame and build it. But if you're short-sighted and what you think you want today is all you settle for, you begin to forfeit the future God has for you because of what you feel right now. Don't forfeit your future over a feeling. I think I will, Tony. Don't forfeit your future over a feeling. Ecclesiastes 3.11 gives us theological precedent for what it is that I just told you. Here's Ecclesiastes 3 and 11. This is the wise king telling us what he sees at the end of his life. He says, he has made everything beautiful, watch this, in its time. Say that with me. In its time. One more time. In its time. He has made it beautiful in its time. You, you want the relationship now because you've been single and lonely for so long that you want it now. So you're willing to lay down. You wouldn't to lay down and give up what you shouldn't give away because you don't want it in it. And God says, ain't nothing wrong with sex. I like it. I made it. He said, but it's beautiful in it. He has made everything beautiful in its time. You want your success so bad that you're willing to shortcut certain things and cut corners and cut off people and step on necks. But God says, no, your success and your prosperity is exactly what I wanted for your life, but I want you to get it in he said, he has made everything beautiful. Don't miss this. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Why is it not beautiful? You got it at a time. Well, why is it not working for me? You got it at a time. Well, why is it failing? You got it at a time. And here's not only has he made it beautiful in his time, so you need to be patient and not be short-sighted. Wait on the Lord. And again, I say, wait. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Not only do we have the ability, Catherine, to frame the future when we are submitted to the will of God, we can actually live into the eternal purpose of God. As a matter of fact, everybody in here, whether you're in denial or not, has eternity set in your heart. Whether you're denying God or not, this is why you don't want to die. Eternity is in your heart. This is the reason why you want to look young and feel young and reverse your age. You got eternity in your heart. Here's the reason why I stopped trying to look young. Is that at one point, I wanted Mike to start dying my beard. I got gray and start coming in, start thinking about it. Mike, I'm going to need you to start putting that dye in my beard. And the Lord said, no, you're not going to do it. You know why? Because I understand that eternity is not about me reversing time. It's me living into his promise. Yeah. Yeah. He says, watch this, he has made everything beautiful in his time. Keep going, Karen. He has also set eternity in the human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. Watch this. He says, I made everything beautiful in his time. I placed eternity in your heart, which means you got expectation that if you wait, I'll give you what you need. I got, you got expectation, something greater is coming. And then still live into the mystery that God wants to do something that no eye has seen. No ear has heard, neither has it entered his thoughts of man what he has in store for those of us who love him. Amen. Watch this. The birthright is about progeny, prestige, property, and power. When the oldest son got the birthright, here's what he got. He got progeny, which means the descendants will be known by his name. It was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But could it be that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because Esau forfeits his birthright. That the birthright is about progeny. 
The birthright is about legacy. That Esau forfeits his legacy. And watch what the text says. It's important for you to understand this because the Bible makes it very clear. The Bible says Esau comes in and he's short-sighted. Quick! Short-sighted. Quick! Let me have some of that red stuff. That's the literal translation. Let me have some of that red stuff. I'm hungry. I'm famished. Watch what he says. In parentheses, the writer in search. That is why he is also called Edom. No, notice this, that everybody, we talked about uh, uh, yesterday at, at, at the funeral, that, 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 that the boy got the nickname Red when he was born. That's the same thing that happened to Esau. He gets the nickname Red when he's born. But then it shifts from being a description of his body to a description of his character. Watch this, that he gets the nickname Edom, which also means red, but it's based on this incident, not what he looks like. While it was once a physical characteristic, it has now become a character trait. That watch this, everybody now is mocking him, calling him red, because he sold his life for stew. I don't want to be known for that. I don't want to be known for that. And I don't know what your that is. I don't know what it is that you're willing to sell your birthright or your promise from God over. But I don't want to be known for that. I know I've made some mistakes in my life. And I thank God for the grace and mercy that he's afforded to me. But as I move forward from this day forward, I'm going to try to determine in my head that I won't be known for that. I'll be known for my faithfulness, but not for that. I'll be known for my dedication, but not for that. I'll be known for my holiness, but not for that. I'll be known for my joy, but not for that. I'll be known that I love, but not for that. I'll be known that I am the keeper of the promises and the word and the will and the way of God, but not for that. I refuse to be known for and especially not over a bowl of soup. Here it is. Text says, text says that he is now called Edom. So Edom is the one that we believe is short-sighted. But also what we believe about Esau is he is selfish. Maybe you're not that hungry, but maybe you are selfish. E Esau was not that hungry. He couldn't have been that hungry. You can't be that hungry. No, you're short-sighted. That you're selling your birthright for a pot of soup. But he's also selfish. The text says that uh, Jacob says, quick, 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 uh, you need to sell me your birthright before I give you some of this stew. Stew that was already his already on the table, already something that he was going to get ready to get. Here's the problem. Your enemy is waiting to manipulate the situation. And here's what happens. Jacob says, um, give me your birthright. And, and, and Esau is just selfish. He says, cool, because what does the birthright mean to me if I die? He's only thinking about himself. He's only thinking about what's going on with him. His flesh is the most important thing in this moment. His desire is the most important thing in this split second. His, his hunger is the only thing he can think about. And I think that's how many of us live. We can only think about what we want. We can only think about what we desire. We can only think about what we, what, what, what we can get. And y'all say, what, what does this have to do with the selfishness? The man was hungry, but he sold his birthright for hunger. The, the real question that we have to ask is, why was the firstborn given a double portion? See, when you get the birthright, you also get a double portion. When the father dies, everybody in the house gets an inheritance. When, when the father dies, everybody in the house gets an inheritance. This is the reason why when we read the story of the prodigal son, the younger son understood that inheritance was coming to him. He understood that if the father was dead, I'd get something coming to me. So everybody gets an inheritance. Everybody in the house will be taken care of. But the older son gets what is called a double portion. He gets more than everybody else. He does not receive, though, a double portion so that the rest of the family has to go to Hot Springs, Arkansas for vacation, and he gets trips to Fiji and Dubai. He doesn't get a double portion so that everybody else wears and ones while he wears Jordan 3 exclusives. <laughs> He, he doesn't get a double portion, watch this, so that his, his luxuries can be above everybody else's. He gets a double portion because he also gets a responsibility. Re really what happens when he gets the double portion is the, the, the first portion is for him to live the way that he's called to live. The second portion is for him to take care of everybody else in the house so that if they have a need that their portion can't cover, he has to take care of it. He's responsible for the house. 
The, the birthright meant that I'm not selfish. I got to take care of those that are around me. The birthright meant that I can't just think about me. I got to think about everybody else. The birthright meant there is more to this thing than what it is that I feel. He was to take care of the other members of the family. Can I pause and parenthetically say this to a group of people who I believe are doing better than some other people around you? I need to challenge you. This speaks to the intention of God that those of us with much should look out for those who have less. I need, to understand, I need you to understand this. It is the responsibility of those who have much to take care of those who have less. God says, to whom much is given. Oh, y'all thought God was just saying stuff? No, he traces it back to the best aisle. He traces it back to the double, double, double portion. He traces it back to what it is that you've received. You can't just hold and hoard what it is that God has given you. He's placed it in your hand for release. Here's the problem. God says that every time I see irresponsibility, I'm going to bless you with the double portion. But when I see irresponsibility, I will allow it to be taken. God says, when I see irresponsibility, I can't promote that. I can't promote the fact that you've been given much, and the only thing you're doing is wasting it on living that is not giving a, 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 being a blessing to other people. God says, no, I need to see how you're going to do it. Esau proves that he can't handle resources well. Because the first thing he thinks about when his flesh is disturbed is leveraging his possessions to satisfy his own needs. Y'all miss what I just said. He proves he can't be responsible with the family. He proves he can't be responsible. With, to, to, watch this. You've been faithful over. I'll make you ruler over. God says if you can be faithful over little, I'll make you ruler over much. This is a test. Esau wasn't faithful over his little bitty fleshly desire of hunger. And the birthright that he had not even possessed yet. He sold off something he didn't even have in his hands. He sold his expectation. He says, watch this. You can't be, you can't be trusted, Esau. Why God let Jacob take that man's birthright? Because Esau couldn't be trusted. In the scripture, I need y'all to see this. Up to this point in the scripture, up to this very moment in the scripture, the reversal of the firstborn has happened a few times. And every time it happens, it happens when the firstborn's character will not sustain the responsibility. We see it happen first. There's two brothers named Cain and Abel. Cain is the older, Abel is the younger. Cain can't handle the responsibility. He has a bad character. Sin is crouching at your door. Instead of him fixing the issue inside of him, he kills his brother. No character. God honors the younger. Isaac and Ishmael are another example of it in which we see. Now, y'all would say Ishmael didn't do anything to cause it. No, but Ishmael represents the flesh. Esau is a representation of the flesh. That Esau's very existence was because Abraham did not trust God enough to trust his word. That he said, we're going to do it in the flesh instead of doing it God's way. Ishmael then has not received the birthright. Isaac gets it. The one y'all don't know about probably more is the fact that Reuben was the firstborn. But the blessing goes to Ephraim and Manasseh. Why does the blessing go to Ephraim and Manasseh? Because Reuben slept with his stepmom, or one of the concubines of Jacob. What does that mean? It means that he, 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 he fulfills the desire of the person he's supposed to be caring for. He fulfills his desire by taking advantage of somebody he's supposed to be caring for. He sleeps with a woman that's a part of the household. He's supposed to be the firstborn. Your job is to protect the flock. Your job is to feed the flock. Your job is to be there for them. But he takes advantage of them? God says, I will reverse it every time I see your responsibility. And such is the case with Jacob and Esau. In the scripture, we see this reversal every single time. God has not called us to receive resources just for us. Esau is selfish, and God has warnings against selfishness. As a matter of fact, he calls us to generosity. Philippians chapter number 2, verse number 3, watch what it says. Paul, writing to the Philippian church, warns against selfishness. He says, do nothing. Somebody say nothing. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. I got to get mine. This is the problem we have in our culture today. And I could boil it down to the specifics of our culture, but I want to just talk culture in general. Read between the lines. We want to take our own money and resources and titles and elevate while leaving everybody behind, then complain about what other people won't do for us. Woo! I got quiet in here. Y'all don't want to deal with me. Back to the scripture. Do nothing. Somebody say nothing. nothing. Out of selfish ambition. Here's the thing. You got goals and promises and things and plans that all deal with your selfish ambition. And the scripture said do nothing out of selfish ambition. Yes, you ought to want the promotion. Yes. 
Yes, you ought to want better. Yes, you ought to want more. Yes, you ought to not be complacent. But you ought to not want it all for just you. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or out of vain conceit. I earned this. I deserve this. If there was anybody who deserved this, it's your boy. If there was anybody who needs this, it's your girl. I mean, I work hard. I work so hard that you can't tell me nothing. When I step out in my this or my that, I dare somebody to say something. I earn this. And it's not that I don't want you wearing it or driving it or living in it, but if it's because you think you're so good that you have it, you got a problem and it is it. Do Nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, here's how you handle it. Here's how you get it. He says, I, I'm not saying don't do nothing. Because he, he, the rest, I could do a whole other sermon to the do nothings. Because there are several of y'all in here right now that are do nothings. And you just ain't going to do nothing. But he says, no, do nothing out of selfish ambition, which means there's something for you to do. And you do it in humility. Valuing others, watch this, above yourself. Which means I don't think primarily about how it's just going to affect me. I need to be healthy so that I can bless somebody else. I need to have the bread so that I can bless somebody else. I need to be in position so that I can shelter somebody else. I need to be able to drive it so that I can inspire somebody else. I do it not just for me, but for them. And ultimately, I don't even do it for them. The text is going to teach you, I do it for him. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather than humility, value Every, value others above yourselves. And this we do to the glory of God. Esau was short-sighted. Esau was selfish. Some of y'all might say, but Robert, isn't there a difference between being selfish and survival? I mean, what good is the birthright, like he said, if he's dead? I mean, the man was starving. Was he really? I mean, was he really about to die? I mean, my man got all the energy in the world to burst into the house. And with all his energy, quick, bro, I need for you to, no, the Bible should have said, and the Bible's detailed, and it does not waste for it. He should have passed out at the door. <laughs> Jay. <laughs> and Jacob, like, oh, my God, he needs food. He couldn't have articulated what it is that he needed if he was dying. The ability to speak what you want means you still got time. They missed it, but I'll say it again. The ability for you to speak what you want means you still got time. As long as you got a pulse, you got a purpose. And if you can open up your mouth and articulate to God, God, this is my request. I still got time to see it fulfilled. And if it means I got to wait on it, I'll be patient until you show up. It's already in the house. It's already in the house. Why not wait three more minutes? I'll say it anyway. He watched this. He wastes 30 years for three minutes. Y'all missed this. Uh, some of y'all have been in relationships where the 30 years of your life got squandered over a three-minute relationship. Oh, you, you know what I'm talking about. You don't want to admit it because your kid's in the room. Uh, but you ain't even enjoy it that much anyway. And now every day, you said, well, it's 18 years. No, it ain't 18 years the rest of your life. Because that little joker got to get married. That little joker going to have grandkids. That little joker going to go to college. And for three minutes of your life, you wasted 30 years. Oh. Yeah, they'd be like, I want to preach it that be real. No, you don't. Because the real is too real. And here he is, selling his soul for soup. He wasn't really in danger, and we're really not in danger. He wasn't really dying, and you're not really dying. He didn't really need the food at that moment. He could have waited for dinner with the family, which also proves he don't even want to sit down with the people he's going to be responsible for. Here's what the text says. The text says that he says, if I die, what good is the birthright? But you weren't dying. See, when we stop expecting, we turn luxuries into essentials at the expense of other people. Say it again, Robert. They didn't get it. When we stop expecting, 
which means when we stop hoping, when we stop believing that God has a bigger plan for us than what it is that we're experiencing in our lives right now, when we stop expecting, we turn luxuries into essentials. That means we make the things that could be luxury, we put them on the level of need. I need this. I want this. I got to have this. I got to have it. Luxuries turn into essentials at the expense of other people. Notice I didn't say that luxuries become essentials and you'd be like, I just live on a different level now. There is a point where you begin to live and your tastes and your lifestyle have elevated. Get that, love that, appreciate that, not at the expense of other people. No, 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 no. Your lifestyle has become so high that when the Lord says, bring all the tithes to the storehouse, you say, I, I budgeted God and I can't. He says, at the expense of those who need what it is that you're supposed to bring, that's your luxuries. And God says, here's the short-sightedness of your selfishness, that if you would have brought what I told you to bring, I would have expanded what it is that I gave. If you would have brought what it is that I told you to bring, I would have expanded what it is that you gave. <laughs> I love y'all. Y'all be talking back to your boy. Uh, watch this. Uh, watch this. We have learned to neglect and even abandon the responsibility that we have toward others for the sake of what we feel right now. And God says, don't you be that selfish. Last point. Let's get out of here. Not only was Esau short-sighted, he was also selfish. But last but not least, he was scorned. Now, Esau's scorning was a result of what it is that he did, but your scorning has led you to do what you do. Y'all don't get it. Let's read the text. Here it is. He says, look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. He makes a legal decision on his future because he wanted a bowl of lentils. He sold his legacy for lentils. He makes a legal decision. It's not like he can go back and be like, you know I was desperate. No, he swears an oath which is legally binding in this time. It's like, it's like he makes a, he, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. He makes a permanent decision on a temporary circumstance. He makes a permanent decision on a temporary circumstance. And many of us have done the same thing. Uh, I talked to the students in the first service. I'll say it again in the second service. Students, don't make permanent decisions on temporary people or circumstances. Don't, don't, don't think that you need something so bad that you run up in somebody's house or somebody's store, something, and you take what's not yours because you think you need it right now. You're making a legal decision. And once you get caught, guess what? You've lost the very freedom you thought you were going after. Amen. Here's the problem. Esau makes this legal decision. He says, all right, I swear an oath. And here's what Jacob does. He's like, cool, I got what I want. You can have his lentils. I was going to give it to you anyway. Because you do understand that the devil can't block you from getting what God has for you. Stop. Let me say it again. The devil can't block you from, get, from God giving you what he has for you. When God has something for you, it is inevitably yours. It is yours for the taking. The Bible says all your promises are. Sing it, not believing it. So when the enemy puts something in front of us and says, will God really give it? Well, he promised it. He said he was going to give it to you. Why don't you believe it? Because the devil cannot prevent God from giving you what he promised you. The problem is we forfeit it. We give up on it. We sell it for soup. I don't know what's in your bowl today. I don't know what your soup is, but I need for you to understand that many of us are just like Esau. And when we sell it, here's the problem. Here's the problem. Once he sells it, the Bible says that he eats it, he eats it, he sits there, he leaves the house. And the Bible says from that day forward, he despised the birthright, which means every time he thought about it, he was angry. Every time he he, he fixed his mind on it. He was upset. He was scorned. Now he's making his decisions out of bitterness. Here's the problem with many of us. Something has happened to us in the past. Maybe somebody did it to us or we did it to ourselves. Now we're bitter. And we refuse to follow the plan of God because of our bitterness. Because we're scorned and we're upset, discontented with life situations. And now because we're scorned, we're not that hungry. We just figure it ain't going to go my way anyway. I might as well do what I want to do. Oh, come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about. And anybody who tells you truth, now they're the problem. They're just judging you now. Well, really what they're trying to do is align you back with what is the best thing for you. But now all of a sudden it's like they just got something to say all the time. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do, do what I want to do. I don't care what they say. You're scorned. And selling your soul for soup. 
And here's what the scripture says about Esau. The Bible says he despises his birthright, but then when we flip over to the book of Hebrews and the Bible describes Esau, I want you to see how the Bible and who the Bible groups Esau with. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 17, here's what it says about Esau. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Here's this Esau. He's going to get to Esau, but I need you to see the context. He says, listen, you need to be at peace with other people. You, you need to understand that God has connected you with certain people and I need you to live holy. He says, I need you to live at peace and I need you to be holy. I need you to live at peace and I need you to be holy. And God says, without holiness, you can't even see me. He says, without holiness, you can't even see me. I love you, but you can't see where I'm moving if you ain't holy. I love you and I'll bless you, but you're not going to get no insight unless you're holy. I love you, but you're not going to be able to figure out what the moves are that you need to make unless you're holy. We have to have Holiness. Somebody say holiness. holiness. It's still right, as the old church says. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Stop. Pause parenthetically. Let's see this. He says also you need to understand that if you're not holy, there's grace available. That If I've messed up, it's not for me to be beat up. It's for me to stand up and to move forward. God says, see to it also that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause, to cause trouble and defile many. Here's the problem. There's some of us who messed up so bad that we're angry with ourselves, angry at life, angry at those who hurt them. And everything that comes out of our mouth is bitter. And when it grows up, it produces a seed of bitterness that literally affects everybody around us. I know some people who are so bitter, everybody in their circle messed up because they've been eaten out of the bitterness of that person's evil heart. And the Lord says, nope, don't be bitter. Don't be bitter. That bitter root will grow up and cause trouble and defile many. Context. Watch what he says next. See to it that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Wait a minute. I thought we was talking about soup. How we get on sex? How we get the sex from soup? You know what the Bible says about Esau, though, right? After he sells the birthright, he despises the birthright. Later on, there is a blessing that is offered to Jacob. Jacob steals the blessing, gets the blessing, and then finds himself in a position where Esau can't get the blessing. He runs away, which is what the next verse says. says even though his tears had put him in a place where he couldn't get the blessing back, he runs away and goes and sleeps out or goes and marries up with other women. But here's what the Bible says. The Bible says he's a fornicator, and he's sexually immoral. I think he was so bitter and so mad, this is what I get from connection to the scripture, that he's just like, I don't have to live according to God's principles anymore. I get to do whatever I want. God denied me. I lost my birthright and the blessing. I'll do whatever I want. That's where some of y'all are living right now. God didn't do for you what you wanted him to do, so you're doing what you want to do. God, God, God didn't answer it the way you wanted him to answer, so now you're going to live the way that you want to live, even if it means killing yourself. Y'all a choir boy from the five heartbeats. Y'all don't remember that scene? My man gets on the phone with his dad, who didn't want him on tour, tries to explain what's going on. We, we pray together. We, we, we pray together. Y'all remember that scene? We, we pray together. W -w 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 was that what you think? His dad's calling him a heathen and telling him he's not saved. You, is that what you think? Is that what you think? W well, that's what I'm going to be. And he drops the phone and leaves his Bible and walks away from every principle that he had. And this is how many of you have lived. Because you had a disagreement with the father. Now, choir boy's dad was out of line. Your father's never been out of line. And because you had a disagreement with the Father, you're going to go and live a life that's going to ruin you instead of going back to him and saying, God, show me how I'm supposed to live. And I need for you to understand this. Esau loses his birthright. And I know some theologians are here, and they're thinking to themselves, well, God was going to take that birthright from Esau anyway because he had promised Jacob. Y'all missed it. The text never said he was going to take Esau's birthright. He said that one nation will be stronger than the other and that the older will serve the younger. And here's what I would argue. I will argue that if Esau had not served, sold his birthright, he would have had more resources to serve his brother. He wasn't supposed to lose the birthright. I believe that Rebecca and, uh, Rebecca and Jacob plot to steal the blessing that God did want Jacob to get because there are two sons in the house. One should have had a birthright and the other should have had a blessing. One should have had the resources, the other should have had the favor. There was one who could have supplied and the other one who could have sought the Lord. And here's what the problem is. Because he sold his birthright, Jacob ends up with both of them. And in this particular house, there are people who are selling their birthright because you're jealous of somebody else's blessing. 
You looking at somebody else's blessing and mad because God didn't bless you like he blessed them, so you're willing to sell your birthright. But God told me to tell you there's a birthright and a blessing in the same house. And God says, I can give you the birthright and give them the blessing. And together, y'all can accomplish my will wherever I tell you to go. But you can't do it when you're scorned and you're bitter. I'll give you one last scripture and one last story and we're out of here. There's a um, show that I watched on Amazon Prime. I'm giving you spoiler alerts. So if you want to leave, walk out. I won't consider you rude. It's called Riches. And it's about these African business hair care products. Amazing show. You haven't seen it yet, Will? You have? All right, y'all better leave right now. Close your ears. I'm going to give you just one spoiler. One spoiler. You're still a good season. I'd watch it again. So watch this part with better detail. But this father dies and he leaves an inheritance to his children. I won't give him the details about who the kids are, where they are, you got to see that. But he leaves an inheritance to his kids to run the company that he has created. And the company that he has created is very successful. But the kids disagree on how things should go. And here's what happens. At one point in the movie or in the show, they decide, they're, they're making a decision whether they should just sell the business. That what they've inherited, they don't feel like they can keep. They're going to just sell it off to the highest bidder. And they're going to sell it off because they have an immediate need of cash flow. Because they have an immediate need, they're willing to sell off the legacy. Because they have an immediate need, they're willing to sell off what it is that the father has entrusted into their hands. And here's the problem. They get the board of directors, which are family members and other people who've invested over the years. And everybody who sits at the board decides to sell. But when you look at everybody that's uh, decided to sell, when they vote, this is the reasons why they vote. Some of them were short-sighted. And they couldn't see the future of what the company could produce. Some of them were selfish. They just wanted the immediate payout of what it is they could do. They could not help but think about themselves and no one else around them. Some of them were scorned. They were upset with somebody else at the table. And the reason why they wanted to sell was to get back at somebody else. Short-sightedness, selfishness, and being scorned are the reasons why they sold off the legacy. They weren't that hungry. They were just broken. And there are some of us who are in the same position that God has given us this inheritance in Jesus Christ and we're selling it off because we are short-sighted, we are scorned, and we are selfish. But the Bible tells me in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, and you also, this you means the Ephesian church, but he also talks to the church at Freedom Today. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth. Here's what he's saying. He's saying Jesus Christ rose from the dead and the scripture describes him describes him as the firstborn among many brethren. What I tell you about the firstborn? The firstborn receives the inheritance. The firstborn gets a double portion. But here's what the Bible says about him. He's the firstborn. And then it says that we are not just heirs with Christ. Because if we were just heirs, we would get an inheritance. But the Bible elevates us to being joint heirs, which means we receive what it is that Christ receives. We get what he gets, which means there's a double portion waiting on you. And everything that Christ has earned, he gets it for you. Everything that his death accomplished, he gives it to you. The text says in verse 13, and you also were included in Christ. This is why we are in Christ. We're not separate from Christ. Whatever Christ receives, I receive. Whatever Christ has inherited, I inherit. I don't live my own life. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that live in me. If he's got a double portion, I got a double portion. If he got power, I got power. If there's a progeny coming through Jesus, there's a progeny coming through me. If there's property in Christ, there's property in me. He says, I'm in Christ. When you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked with him, marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. He says he gave you the Spirit of God as a seal so that wherever you go, people know, oh, she got the inheritance. Oh, he got the inheritance. You should walk around in the spiritual realm with your chest held high because even demons need to understand you got the inheritance. You got the power. You got the authority. You've got what you need. You're on the Senate level. That's a whole other message that we go backwards for. He says, when you believe, you are marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Watch verse 14. It's so good. Who is a deposit? guaranteeing our inheritance. Here's what God said. You've been bragging about your salvation and your eternal life. God said, that was just down payment. You've been bragging about going to heaven one day. He said, that was just down payment. He said, the spirit of God inside of you is a down payment on the life you're called to live. Yeah. 
on the life you're supposed to live, on the life you're supposed to have. He says he's a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, which means when all the saints come, then we're going to get the fullness of everything. Because guess what? You can't get your inheritance until I get mine. That's selfish. It is. He said, and that, that's when we all come. That's when the eschaton comes. That's when the kingdom arrives, when we all get all of the saints who are called to this place of freedom and salvation, and then we all live forever in eternity in expectation and anticipation fully as God has called us to be to the glory and praise, what it says, of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. That all of this is so that we can give God glory and praise. Here's, here's what I'm challenging you today. I'm challenging you today to put yourself in a position to where the anticipation of your expectation is greater than the temptation of your situation. And if you will begin to live out publicly and proudly the faith that God has for you in the face of the opposition that the, en the enemy presents to you, I'm challenging you not to give up your legacy for lentils. You, you need to understand something. That Esau became sexually immoral not because it was it was something that was the, 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 uh, the thing presented to him. No, it was his next step. The stew was a starter. Which means if I can't face this little temptation, I'm not going to be able to fight off bigger temptations. There is something, thank God for the fast, y'all. Thank God for the fast. If I can't fight off sausage for breakfast, I'm not going to be able to fight off the enemy's temptations to sell y'all out. If, if I can't fight off something at six o'clock when my stomach starts to ground, then there's something on the next level that God is preparing me for that I need to learn to tell my flesh, down boy, wait on the Lord. And again, I say, wait, wait for him and be of good courage. Wait for him because the promise is yet to come that what he has given you, the vision is for an expected end. There is an expectation and an anticipation that outweigh the temptation of my situation. Stand on your feet. Maybe you're here today. And you're challenged. Like, well, what do I do next? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to give your life to Jesus. And how, 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 how do you do that? You just simply say, God, what you have for me, I believe it's got to be better than what I have for myself. And here's what I said in the first service, and I believe this is so apropos for everybody who's listening to me right now. I don't want you to give your life to Jesus so that you can think, well, if I die tonight, would I go to heaven? That, that is a part of the package. But the probability of any one of you leaving here and dying is probably not high. Here's the reality. If you live tomorrow, do you have the power to do it? If you wake up tomorrow, do you have the power to live the life that you've been called to live? That's the real question I got for you. This is why I want you to give your life to Christ. This is why I want you to give your life to Jesus so that you can begin to experience this great inheritance. So that you can begin to experience the favor that is associated with the Father's house. So that you can be able to experience and prepare yourself for the next level of responsibility that he's given you. So that you can train yourself for the trial. you got to give your life to Christ. Our prayer team is coming down and they'll be in the front right now. And, and as they're down here, anybody who says, I want to place my hope, my expectation, my faith, my anticipation, my expectation in Christ, you can come down here and say, hey, I want to give my life to Jesus. And they'll pray for you. They'll pray for you and tell you what it is that you need to do next. If you don't want to come up here, there's a, a hallway out there. Talk to somebody in the hall and say, hey, I want to give my life to Jesus. I pray that you're not ashamed to come here and get your prayers uh, answered here in this moment. If you need to give your life to Jesus, do it here. There's also those of you who need prayer for some other reason. That there are situations that you're facing right now that need some revelation. That it's more than just something you can do by yourself. You need somebody to speak over and into what it is that you're going through. Prayer is the key. We are a family. That one putting one putting a thousand to flight, but two ten thousand to flight. That means when you come to pray, there are two of you. And the spirit realm begins to answer whatever it is that's happening in your life show up at this altar and be prayed for so that God can get to moving on behalf of your situation. I'm going to pray close out this message and as you uh, feel led, come to the altar and receive prayer. You don't have to wait for the end of this service. You don't have to wait for me to stop talking. I'll finish praying and we'll conclude the service but don't you dare feel like you've got to wait for some formal moment. Your time is now. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for the example of Esau and Jacob and the things that we can learn about 
you and your faithfulness and us and our fickleness. God, we pray in the name of Jesus that we would not be like Esau who sold his birthright for temporary satisfaction. But that, God, we would no longer be short-sighted, selfish, or scorned. But we walk in the fact that we are supported by you and sourced from you. That we can have all things that you have promised us and that your spirit guarantees it. God, I pray in the name of Jesus for your people while they are on this fast. That this will be the training wheels for the fighting of their temptations. And that they will walk in the level of holiness after this that would afford them the ability to see God and to move forward, to do what it is that you called them to do and experience the power that you have in their lives. God, I pray from every student all the way up to the oldest member of our church. God, I pray power over their lives right now. Power to resist temptation. Power to move forward in their passion. Power to move forward in purpose. Power to live out the promises that you have on their lives. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that that power begin to fall even right now. God, we pray in the name of Jesus for those who want to give their lives to you, that they will come and they will find themselves at this altar receiving what it is that you have for them. Those who need prayer for any reason, no shame will be attached to what they're doing, that they will come and they will receive what you have for them in this prayer moment. We love you. We honor you with expectation. We thank you for what it is that you are going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give God praise.